Now, as I am making this video, there's been reports of another um, devastating attack on a railway station in this town of Kramatorsk, and it seems that about 27 civilians may have been killed, two of whom were children. These were people who were trying to evacuate from the city. Now, this is a devastating tragedy, and one is desperately sorry for the people caught up in this attack. Already there's been the usual finger pointing by both sides. The uh, Ukrainians, predictably, say it's the Russians, and of course this is a Russian a Ukrainian controlled city. The Russians, for their part, deny that categorically. They say they weren't launching any attacks, missile strikes on Kramatorsk at that time. And they also argue or say that the missile that attacked Kramatorsk, of which there are pictures, um, is of a type that has been withdrawn from use with the Russian armed forces and which is only used by Ukraine. I follow my iron rule, which is that I don't attribute responsibility to either side in this kind of comp in this kind of affair, unless there's a proper investigation, of which, of course, there never will be. I, uh, I think it is impossible to do otherwise. One observation I'm going to make or rather I will make two observations. The first is that the photographs which have appeared of what is claimed to be the missile definitely show, apparently, according to those who know such things, a Tochka U. I would not be able to identify the type of missile myself, but everybody who has says that it is a Tochka U. Now, the Russians didn't do deny that they operate these systems. However, I don't in, in itself consider that conclusive, perhaps, if the Russians did decide to attack this railway station, they would have wanted to conceal the fact by using a, a missile system of a kind that the Ukrainians still use. I'm not saying that's what happened, by the way. I just suggest that. The one thing that I do find completely bizarre, however, is that it's uh, this uh, missile warhead appears to be daubed by some kind of aggressive comment about children, which I'm not even going to say what it is because I find it so repulsive. Now, if the Russians were trying to conceal their involvement by using a Tochka U, which they've taken out of service in their own armed forces, but which is still used by Ukraine, then the decision to use this particular type of, to, to make this particular kind of statement on the missile seems to contradict that and makes little sense to me. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about this incident, save, of course, that it's going to become, like all other incidents of this kind, part of the information war that has been waged simultaneously by both sides in this conflict, with the supporters of each side choosing to take whatever position about it they wish to take. I'm not going to, as I said, comment on it further, and for the record, I expect that before very long, the people who control this particular platform that I'm making this particular broadcast on will be taking measures to make sure that only one particular um, claim about this affair is publicised. Anyway, let's discuss the substantive military events. Um, now, there's some discussion, there was some talk um, a couple of days ago by people like Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, that the battle in Donbass will only really start in a few weeks' time once the Russians have completed their redeployment. In my previous programme, I expressed deep scepticism about this. It seemed to me that the fighting is actually going on all the time and there's been absolutely no let up in it and certainly more Russian troops are going to be redeployed but this is simply going to increase the intensity of the fighting that is already happening and that seems to me to be the case. We have had more reports from Mariupol that the Russians, the Chechens and the forces of the militia of the Donetsk People's Republic now control 98% of the city of Mariupol. The um, Ukrainians are reduced to a, sm a small number of holdouts in the industrial areas of the city. 
Now, these have been apparently heavily um, protected. These are heavily protected areas. And in terms of the two factories that the Ukrainians still are holding out in, the Azov-style steelworks and the Ilich factory, there are apparently underground corridors and bunkers which the Ukrainians can also use. Now, I remember on the topic of bunkers, by the way, many, many years ago, at the time of the first um, war against Iraq, US war against Iraq, the one in 1991, having a discussion with somebody, a military person at that time, and he made the point to me that though underground bunkers can protect troops, they can also act as a trap for them. They can be entombed in them, which is a very grisly fate. Now, that was about the war in 1991 between the Western powers and Iraq. I can't say whether this is true, obviously, of the fighting at the Azov-style steelworks and the Ilich factory, but I don't, for the record, see why not. So, um, bunkers underground facilities of this nature may be useful in some respects but they could be extremely dangerous for defending troops as well. I just make that observation. There's enormous amount of debate um, on the RUNET, the Russian internet, about how long it will take the Russians and their allies to clear these factories, whether it will take long time, weeks, or days, even hours, obviously, I'm in no position to say. What I would say is that since these are industrial facilities without civilians, the Russians have shown no compunction in bringing heavy artillery to bear, and I would have thought that this would have an effect on the course and timeline of the fighting. However, if the fighting around at Mariupol is what is perhaps still drawing the major attention. And if the battles, the, the this missile strike in Kramatorsk is the one that's making the headlines, it seems to me that from the point of view of the respective commanders, it's events um, south of Izium that are probably the greater concern, because it's clear that the Russians are now steadily and methodically pushing forward south from Izium towards the slavyansk kramatorsk conurbation, where the Ukrainian troops in Donbass appear to be increasingly concentrating with a view to perhaps making their last stand. I should say that elsewhere in Donbass, the Ukrainians are also, it would seem, in retreat. Apparently an important um, town I would say important, but it's not a city, it's about 14,000 people, or at least that's the number that, that were there before the war, um, which the Ukrainians called Vuglada and the Russians call Uglada. There's lots of arguments about the naming of these places. Um, has now been surrounded by the Russian troops, and apparently elsewhere there have been continuing, continuing, indeed, if anything, accelerating advances by the Russians and the forces of the Donetsk People's Republic. So it seems to me that Stoltenberg's claim that the war, the fighting, um, you know, will only really start in Donbass in a few weeks is frankly a misunderstanding or a misjudgment of what is actually, or a misrepresentation of what is actually going on and going on all the time. Fighting continues and is um, intensifying and um, at the moment the Russians and their allies continue to make advances. I would also say, by the way, that I've received more videos of the outcome of the fighting and it remains deeply distressing. I've seen lots of dead bodies of Ukrainian soldiers. Obviously, these videos come from the Russian side. I'm not going to share these videos, by the way. They come from the RUNET. For one thing, I can't fully vouch for their complete accuracy. I can't say where these videos are. But it do seem to point to 
they do seem to confirm the point that I made in a programme about a week ago. That large numbers of people, many, many people, are dying in Donbass. And the information that I'm getting, which I have no reason to doubt, is that the greater proportion of these, by far, are young Ukrainian soldiers. They're dying in their tens and hundreds and probably thousands in Donbass in a war which Ukraine cannot win. I saw, by the way, that Yanis Varoufakis, the former, econo uh, the former finance minister of Greece, has become an important commentator and a harsh critic of the Putin government, also says that this is a war which Ukraine cannot win. Well, we briefly were in the same class, in the same school in Greece, so perhaps if you want, you can say that's the reason why we share these views. We were educated perhaps briefly in the same way. Actually, I don't think so. I think he is probably seeing the same information that I'm seeing and is coming to the same conclusions. Anyway, that's what I get to say about the military affairs. Perhaps the economic ones, the sanctions and military issues are, um, in the West are becoming more interesting because it seems to me increasingly we're seeing a sense of growing alarm in the West, and I speak carefully now, um, at the direction that events are taking. First of all, there was an attempt at the United Nations, at the General Assembly of the United Nations, to use the events in that suburb of Kiev, whose name I'm not going to repeat, again for the same reasons that I discussed earlier when discussing this missile strike at Kramatorsk. Um, anyway, there was an attempt to try to mobilise international opinion and the basis upon it was a vote at the General Assembly to remove or to suspend Russia's membership from the United Nations Human Rights Council. Now, I should say the Human Rights Council, the UN Human Rights Council, is largely a talking shop. It has a rotating membership. Um, other countries like Saudi Arabia and the United States have at various times withdrawn in disgust from it. Um, both, by the way, are currently members. But um, in and of itself, I think this is more a token or symbolic event than anything else. It was done. This vote was staged, I think, in an attempt to claim that after the events around Kiev, there's been a groundswell of opposition to Russia in the global community. Well, if so, then I'm going to say straight away that, in my opinion, the vote at least backfired. Because though, of course, the United States was able to mobilise the necessary majority to remove Russia from the Human Rights Council. The numbers were far from overwhelming. If you add up the number of countries which either voted against the resolution or abstained, they came very close to equaling the number of countries who voted to remove or suspend Russia's membership of the Human Rights Council. In fact, overall, there's been a reduction in the number of countries that are supporting anti-Russian resolutions at the General Assembly as compared with the situation uh, a few weeks ago. And I think that is in itself disappointing, but even more disappointing for the Western powers is that the big, heavyweight, powerful countries outside the West, the collective West, um, a, a preponderant majority of them voted against this resolution or abstained. So China backed Russia, voted against the resolution. India, Indonesia, Pakistan all voted to abstain. So it's proving clearly impossible to mobilise the global community against Russia in this way. I understand Iran also voted against the resolution. I believe, though I'm not absolutely sure, that Saudi Arabia abstained. So there is far from being 
an international consensus against Russia across the entire world community, despite what you sometimes hear, hear and read said in the Western media. But anyway, this event at the, at the UN General Assembly happened alongside a NATO summit meeting. And the interesting thing about this NATO summit meeting is that the Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kuleba came along and urgently requested more weapon systems. And the kind of weapon systems he seems to be requesting are the sort of weapon systems that um, Ukraine, it's now increasingly admitted, is running fast out of. Now, the Russian air campaign in Ukraine has been primarily focused, or so it seems to me, at destroying Ukraine's ammunition, oil, interfering with its railway movements, and it's now uh, increasingly clear that it's taken a massive toll of Ukraine's armoured forces, its tanks, its armoured vehicles. The Russians claim that they have destroyed around four-fifths of them. And indeed, it is increasingly the case that when you see Ukrainian forces deployed on the battlefield, they are increasingly obliged to use soft-skinned civilian vehicles, which of course make them desperately vulnerable in the event of an encounter battle, and which realistically they cannot take into battle, and which provide them with minimal protection in the event of airstrikes. So, Ukraine is rapidly running out of armour. And the NATO meeting saw the Ukrainian foreign minister desperately asking for more armour to protect the Ukrainian forces. And this apparently led to a deep discussion. Now, the British obviously do want to send armour to Ukraine. But the problem is, or so it seems, that the East European states that have been providing most of the material that Ukraine has been receiving, the, the tanks, the infantry fighting vehicles and all the rest, they have essentially run out of supplies to send. There's also an interesting article in the Financial Times, which I'm not, by the way, going to link to. It's behind a paywall. But it says that the West has also run out of ammunition that it can send to Ukraine. Ukraine uses mainly, principally, um, Soviet-era artillery that uses Soviet-era calibers, like 152mm calibers. NATO uses larger, bigger calibers, 155mm calibers. So artillery shells, NATO artillery shells, are not interchangeable with former Soviet ones. And the Western powers cannot simply replace the artillery shells that Ukraine has been expending. So there's now a debate about whether to send NATO material instead. But this, of course, has provoked debate and alarm because, of course, the level of loss that Ukraine is experiencing in the fighting is such that NATO would struggle, even if he did start to send armoured vehicles to Ukraine, to replace Ukraine's losses, especially as those losses continue to mount. So there was a debate about, there's been a debate in Germany about sending a hundred old Marder infantry fighting vehicles. The Marder, by the way, is apparently an infantry fighting vehicle which was originally designed in Germany in the 1950s. Still apparently a potent infantry fighting vehicle in itself. Um, um, but these are old versions that would require extensive refurbishment. And besides, Germany doesn't have vast stocks of infantry fighting vehicles that it can send. Besides, it would take a long time to retrain Ukrainians to use these vehicles. And as I've said, the fighting in eastern Ukraine is taking place every day and all the time, with the Ukrainians steadily losing ground. So the question is, sending the refurbishing these vehicles would take weeks. Retraining the Ukrainians to use them would take 
more weeks. And the number that would be supplied would anyway be insufficient to make any change to the overall direction of the battle. And besides, unless the Western powers were prepared to engage Russia directly with a no-fly zone and all those things, which has been repeatedly ruled out, well, then in that case, um, the likelihood is that these weapon systems would be quickly destroyed by the Russian air and missile forces, making no essential difference to the overall outcome of the battle. So this has led to a huge row in Germany between the Greens, who, of course, are desperate to press on supplying these weapon systems to Ukraine, um, with Hambeck and Baerbock apparently demanding that these old vehicles do be, be supplied to Ukraine, and Olaf Scholz, and I suspect more people within the historic German establishment apparently resisting this and becoming increasingly, no doubt, unhappy about the general state of the situation and of the conflict in which Germany has now propelled itself into. All of this happening at the same time as there's been further evidence of ever-mounting surges in fuel and food prices in Europe and globally around the world. Now, let me repeat again, the Western powers never expected, never Im imagined that they would find themselves in this position. I'm sure that when they took that decision to, to impose sanctions on the Russian central bank and to freeze its reserves and to launch an economic war against Russia, I'm sure that they confidently expected that the Russian economy, which they seem to have persuaded themselves as a house of cards, would quickly implode. Now they are finding themselves increasingly instead in an economic war of attrition, which certainly in Europe the Europeans are not ready for. And already one gets a sense that support is starting to sag. We've had elections in Hungary, and already we're seeing a tightening of the opinion polls in France. And there's now, I suspect, growing unease in Germany and probably elsewhere as well. And I suspect that there's probably a feeling starting to take hold in Europe that the summer months are the only period of time, the only window that the West has in order to try to succeed um, in forcing a resolution on the Russians on Western terms. Because if the situation continues as it is doing by autumn and winter, then the situation is going to become incredibly difficult, both economically and eventually politically in Europe itself. Now, I should say that the Financial Times recently did a further article, which I will provide a link to, even though it is behind a paywall, in which it made it very clear that um, the industry, the energy industry, has been making it completely clear that there is no actual replacement available for Russian pipeline gas. It is simply not feasible to reduce supplies to the extent that's been uh, suggested from Russia without this having a major impact on the European economy. There's been suggestions that the way to do it would be to impose rationing, to close down big industrial companies in order to keep households warm. But of course the risk in doing that is that you precipitate a major economic recession, layoffs of workers, all of that across Europe. And of course, how long can you keep that going anyway? It's not something you can continue to do indefinitely. Eventually, your industrial structure starts to break down if you place it on temporary suspension in that way. And, of course, the reality is that long before you get to that point, politics begins to intervene. So, we are in this kind of time window. 
Now, the German economics minister, Robert Habock, appears to have his particular plan, which is to buy as much natural gas from Russia as possible before the winter, fill up the underground reserves um, by winter, and hope that that provides Germany with sufficient margin to keep things going through the winter. And then, and then, I'm not sure what, because it's not clear to me that he has any essential plan beyond that. Now, of course, you can reduce, for a temporary period, supplies of gas from Russia. If you do that, if you have filled up your reserves, but if there's no other gas either liquefied natural gas um, or gas from Norway or the Netherlands. And I, this article in the Financial Times suggested that the option to increase gas from Norway and the Netherlands simply isn't there. Then, as I said, this is a temporary thing. And I don't really see how it's going to work for Germany in the long term. The alternative is to keep pipeline flows from, Je from Russia continuing. But then that, of course, starts, even if you do this at a reduced level, to undermine the entire logic of the sanctions. So it does seem as if there is only this small time window. And I have to say, given that this is so, the danger of escalation increases because people like Habeck and Beerbock and in Britain, Johnson, are now caught in a position where they must escalate to the point of achieving victory, or if they don't, then they face what could very well turn out to be, from their point of view, a grim political and economic reckoning. So this is going to be a particularly dangerous few months that we're going to see over the next um, few uh, uh, um, um, coming forward. Um, it'll be over the course of the summer, in my opinion, that this crisis is going to be decided. Meanwhile, we have seen another form of escalation take place. I've repeatedly said that the way to end this crisis is through diplomacy, through Ukraine essentially agreeing to Russian conditions. Last week in Istanbul, the Ukrainians made major moves in that direction. Far from this being welcomed in Western capitals, it provoked dismay there. So we have pressure from Britain and the United States to Ukraine to reverse the concessions it made in Istanbul and to take a harder line in the negotiations. And that is precisely what, according to Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov, the Ukrainians have now done. And though the Ukrainians now accept, still accept that Ukraine won't join NATO, in other respects they've made, they backtracked on some of the concessions they made about Donbass, about Crimea, and about the um, uh, nature, about, about uh, um, a Russian veto on troop deployments, foreign troop deployments in Ukraine. Lavrov has made it absolutely clear that for the Russians that is unacceptable. And he's also made it clear that from a Russian point of view, if the Ukrainians don't once again return to the original positions that they were taking and go beyond them, then this military campaign will continue until it eventually achieves its full objectives. I've no doubt that Lavrov is not bluffing. I've no doubt either that the Russians have all the means necessary to counter whatever weapon systems the West sends to Ukraine. The time window, as I said, to achieve a diplomatic settlement is probably to be counted in over the summer, if our leaders in the West do not start to reflect on realities, don't let that, don't put their emotions of anger and all the rest to one side, then I suspect we're going to be facing a very tough autumn and winter um, in the next few months. 
that's my overall assessment of where we are. Thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to you joining me again soon, future programs on this channel. Always remember though, however, to check us out on our main channel, The Duran, where we're doing live streams with all sorts of people, with Scott Ritter. We did a brilliant one with Scott Ritter last uh, this week. And I'm hoping before long, we will be doing other live streams with him and with other guests. And of course, our great friend, Gonzalo Lira, who reports from Kharkiv, from Ukraine itself, 